Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Stephen Evans, Executive Director of PhotoFest, and I'm here to welcome you to our latest Creative Conversation Digital. And this is a series that we started at the onset of COVID, but we're continuing so that we can reach greater numbers of people and also have all of these wonderful talks archived on the PhotoFest website and on our YouTube page. Um, to see past talks, you can go to www.fotofest.org and check them out. Tonight, we're going to be talking to two of the featured artists who made a collaboration for the current exhibition in place of an index. The artists are Or Rosenberg and Adam Marney, and we're really pleased to have their collaboration on view in the galleries. And we're just also thrilled to have the exhibition, which was co-curated by PhotoFest Associate Curator and Director of Publishing, Max Fields, along with the Texas Biennial co-curators, Ryan Dennis and Evan Garza. This, um, this exhibition at PhotoFest is the sole Houston venue for the Texas Biennial this year. And um, we're really excited to be representing uh, that in Houston for our audience and also just to be featuring uh, such a great exhibition of um, challenging and forward thinking artists that we have. And um, I congratulate all of them and Max and Ryan and Evan on the exhibition. I'd also like to thank the host committee for the exhibition, Lee Anthony and Travis Capps, Katie and Michael Casey, Ken Frederick, Carola Heron, Anna and Hal Holliday, Marsha and Mike Nichols and Ann Wilkes Tucker. We couldn't have made parts of the exhibition come to fruition without their help. And additionally, I'd like to thank PhotoFest major institutional and individual supporters, the Brown Foundation, the Houston Endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Eleanor and Frank Freed Foundation, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, the WWW Foundation, and the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. Additionally, our individual supporters, Judith and Gamble Baldwin, Wendy Watrous and Frederick Baldwin, who are our co-founders, Katie and Michael A. Casey, again, Martha and David Moore, Nina and Michael Zilka, the PhotoFest Board of Directors and Silver Street Studios, which is where the exhibition is currently on view. And I hope you'll be able to come by and see it. It's a, it's a rewarding visit. Uh, the galleries are wide and spacious, and um, I think you'll feel very safe if you come to see it. And I hope you can do that. It's up until early November. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce PhotoFest Associate Curator and Director of Publishing, Max Fields, who will introduce the artist and get the conversation started. Max. Thank you so much. Let me make sure that... There we go. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen, for the introduction. Um, and I'm really pleased to um, invite you and to have you here um, to hear Adam Marnie and Ara Rosenberg speak about their work of photo, uh, photo a Day, which is on view in the PhotoFest exhibition in place of an index uh, as a part of the 2021 um, Texas Biennial, A New Landscape, A Possible Horizon, curated by Ryan Dennis and Evan Garza. Um, before I begin with my uh, introduction of Adam and Ara, I should let you know that these bios are quite short in comparison to the incredible amount of work that these artists have and are doing um, and the breadth of their uh, interdisciplinary practices. Um, Adam Marnie is an artist, writer, editor, and publisher based in Houston, where he runs F, an arts organization that brings together publishing and exhibitions that take shape online in his home gallery and via email. Marnie is a graduate of the MFA program uh, at Bard College. His artworks and publishing projects have been exhibited around the globe in notable institutions such as Magenta Plains and MoMA PS1 for the Printed Matter Book Fair in New York, Bad Reputation in Arturo Bandini in Los Angeles, and Gallery Almin Rick in Paris, just to name a few. 
Marnie is a prolific producer and organizer, so I'm sure this information is already too dated to be described as his most recent projects, but he recently organized an exhibition featuring New York-based painter Patricia Treep, uh, which is on view at F in Houston through October 31st. And in September of this year, Marnie published You, the Interpreter. Uh, that's my translation of the book's Italian title, um, a publication featuring the work and writing of No Work. You can learn more about Marnie's work and find information about F at www.fmagazine.info. Ara Rosenberg is an artist, professor, and musician based in New York and Berlin. Rosenberg's photographs, sculptures, video, and installation work has been exhibited internationally in renowned institutions, including MoMA PS1, Hamburger Bahnhof, and the Kunstmuseum Stuttgart. Rosenberg's books, Headshots, Berlin Childhood, and Who Am I, What Am I, Where Am I, respectively highlight the artist's interests in issues and ideas surrounding sexuality, gender, childhood, artistic identity, uh, and historical construction. Rosenberg's practice is often collaborative, such as the work she produces for her bands, The Dirty Mirrors and The Cornichons, for projects such as Headshots, and as well, and as we will learn about um, later tonight, her work, A Photo of a, uh, Photo a Day, created with Adam Marnie. Rosenberg's work has been studied and written about uh, and written about extensively in publications such as Art Forum, The New York Times, Interview Mag Magazine, Freeze, and Artsy, among many, many others. Rosenberg is represented by Martos Gallery in New York, Melixitin Briggs in Los Angeles, and a feminist gallery in Berlin. She has upcoming exhibitions all taking place between 2021 and uh, 2022 at a uh, feminist gallery in Berlin. Uh, Mishkin Gallery in New York, and Museum Nuez Weimar in Germany. You can find up-to-date information about Rosenberg on her website, rrosenberg.com. Um, I'm really thrilled to have these two join us tonight. Um, it's been such a privilege working with them, um, and I'm really excited for you both, uh, or for all of you in attendance, um, to, uh, to hear from both of them. Adam and Aura, if you could join us, um, let's, let's get the show on the road. Oops. There we go. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you again for joining us and thanks for agreeing to be in conversation tonight. I'm really thrilled to share your work with everybody in attendance on Zoom and YouTube. Um, I'd like to start by asking you to provide a bit of context and background uh, for the a photo of a day pro uh, photo a day project. Um, I think it would be interesting for the attending uh, audience to hear about your relationship before this project took off and how you two met and what your prior collaborations looked like. I think I'm going to answer that. Um, but Aura, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us in the exhibition. And congratulations, Max and Stephen, on the exhibition. Um, so um, I I've been thinking about this today. I didn't know if it was going to be the first question or whatever. But um, in two, Aura and I have known each other since 2014, and um, and she is one of my closest friends. Um, in the beginning of 2014, Thomas Corpiaco and I started our self-published magazine, F Magazine. And I, looking for contributors, um, asked my friend Lee Ladair, who studied with Aura's husband, John Miller, at Columbia, um, to introduce us for a studio visit, which she very sort of warmly invited my, or like welcomed my invitation, but, um, you know, to a two hour studio visit, which I know is common for Aura when she does studio visits, even with strangers. And um, so she was in the first issue of the magazine, um, which was a pro has become a project that I've organized a lot of other shows and exhibitions and activities around since then. Um, and, you know, Aura is a master collaborator, like, almost all of her works over the last 40 years are uh, made in collaboration of some kind or another. And um, like the bottom line of that for me is that she's really fun, fun to play with and we have like a great time and she's so like loose and free with her ideas and forms. Um, 
So, um, well, you're or, a master collaborator too. I, I've learned a lot from you about that for sure. Thank um, you. And um, I think that that has become like one of the primary modes that I work in is, is in collaboration. Um, there were 10 issues of the magazine between 2014 and 2020, and Aura was more like in all of the magazines, you know? So we did a lot of stuff like during that time. Um, our project is from October 9th, like the project that's on view at PhotoFest is from October 9th, 2016 to October 10th, 2017, a photo a day. Earlier in 2016, uh, my partner, Rebecca Madeline and I organized the 20 year anniversary uh, exhibition of Aura's headshots at Joan in Los Angeles. And so among like all these other sort of playful, you know, we organized this exhibition and it was just six months later that she and I started this project. So maybe that's like enough to get us to there. Sound good? Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Aura? Um, well, just about headshots that I, I think I told, I remember like sitting in my bedroom one morning and saying to you, I just realized it's been 20 years since I published that book and the work hadn't really been seen that much since then. I mean, in group shows uh, here and there, but, uh, and it was, I don't know, like a week later or something that you called me back and said, can you do a show in April? I think it was. And of course I'm always like, no, I need more time. But Adam just said, you know, you can do it. And then after that, you also organized the show in um, Amsterdam for Headshot right. that you right. talked which, about. Which um, is actually in the, um, in the slideshow, in the 367 yeah. diptychs that make up a photo a day, like the last, maybe the third, last Diptych it includes a photograph of yours from that exhibition, I think. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's a funny way into the project to say that it really does kind of track events that year. Um, that in a way like a diary, but I've never really kept a diary and what do they say a picture's worth a thousand words or something, you know, and that now we kind of can remember that year through these images. Um, by the way, I also really want to thank everybody for inviting us to do this talk tonight. Um, this is this is fun. Thank <laughs> you. Thanks so much. It's great to be in this show. Um, so maybe from there, we can talk about how this project, the project of Photo A Day, actually began. And I'll pull up some images, um, and we can start with the, the very first calendar that's presented in the exhibition, the October 2016 calendar. But perhaps, yeah, um, as I said, you know, how, can, how did this uh, project actually begin? How did this collaboration start? And um, what, was, what were the rules? What was the, the idea? What were the intentions? Um, well, Adam came to me with a proposal that we, and Adam, you, you correct me if my memory is wrong here, but that we were making up some rules to do collaborations. There were going to be, you were making up some rules and I was supposed to make up rules. And I remember like kind of researching all these artists like Baldessari, I think made up a bunch of rules. Like what kind of rules do you make up to work with somebody? Um, and- That's true. We were inventing games to get like assignments to give to each other and inventing games to play with each other. <laughs> and also you sent me some pictures of statues that you had taken in Paris, That's correct? That's right, yeah. And I'm, I've been working uh, with images of statues for a while now, kind of exploring their ramifications of like cultural and ideological uh, lives of statues. So, so that made sense that Adam sent me those photographs and we made some collages out of it for the, um, 
I don't remember if we kind of tried to put, stick to the rules there or if we went off. So you're, the, you're talking about the collaborative, collaborative collages or what? Or from? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, that I think that that happened later. Okay. See, I'm. I'm not quite sure, but we showed them later, at least. But didn't photo a day come out of that? It's quite possible that that was the origin of it. Yeah. I mean, it's a very simple idea. The, at some point, one of the two of us suggested that we start sending each other a picture each day, and. Uh, and then we started doing it. In the beginning, I don't believe that we had any notion of it being a year long or anything. I don't think we put a cap on it in the beginning. I just think it was something that we started to do. Um, that's my memory of it. And then mm -hmm. after we started doing it for three days, five days, we just made, you know, like an, let's do it for a year, I think we said, or something, uh, something like yeah. that. And was, was there, like go ahead. Was that like a fixed rule? Like this is going to be one year and then we'll call it. It was pretty organic. Okay. And I, I like in the beginning also, it was very much a way for us to communicate with each other. And the, like the images were really beautiful and I love Aura's photographs. And so I like, you know, it, very quickly, I think I started thinking about it as artwork that like we would figure out at some point, but um I think initially it was just a way for us to communicate with each other while we were working on other collaborations outside of this. Is there something that was significant about the October 9th start date? Was there like a specific reason the first email went out that day? Maybe it's like a happy birthday to add. Maybe, but it was probably the day at the next day. It was probably the, the day after the day that we decided we were going to start doing it. Mm -hmm. it See, Adam is 10, 10, and I'm yeah. 11, 11. Our birthdays. Yeah. Yeah. Our birthdays, so, so. so it almost, it started the day before my birthday and ended on my birthday of the next year. So I went on um, the structure of the piece, looking at this one image, this is the first, well, this is actually the second of um, 367 diptychs that we made in this way. And the, this is the second picture. Aura's view is the picture on the left, my view is the picture on the right. And um, we, Aura sent me her picture first and I responded with my, my picture. And then the next morning she sent me the same picture that she had sent the day before. And so I sent her the same picture that I, the same view that I took the day before. And so just in the second day, like she, by doing what she did, she set the structure for the piece. So the, the, the one that we're looking at right now, this October 10th, 2016, uh, it, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll see the next one is very similar to this, but this, the importance of this one to me is that it was the beginning of the project mm -hmm. as far as its story. I mean, and my initial idea was that it was going to be out the, I mean, I had to kind of find where I wanted to shoot it. Like I shot out some of my other windows, but it is funny that I gravitated towards the window. Behind you. Um, also, I mean, the window. Is it the window? Me. Is it the window behind you right now? Yes. <laughs> Will you show Aura for a second, Max? Show. Um, show Aura's screen or is it up? Oh, let it's me see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's up. Yeah. Here. It's spotlight. There's but, so the view out the window behind her is the view yeah. that's in all of her pictures. I mean, it's probably why we moved to this apartment because I really love the view out this window. It's it's kind of a little bit of a Bruegel kind of view. Like the earth seems to tip up a little bit. Um, we have two, like what is it? Nine trees, beautiful plane trees at our window, but beyond that, the city spreads out. So it's kind of like nature in the city, uh, you know, I love it. So, uh, but we also live right at the entrance to police headquarters. So there's like a guard booth on the side window. And first I tried shooting that. I thought that could get a little tricky. They might think I was spying on them or something, you know? Um, so then my idea was it was gonna be every day 
exactly the same view. I kind of oriented myself with those lights. And at the same time, like six in the morning, I think when I wake up, that proved to be really elusive. You know, the idea that you could always do it at the same time or even in the same place. But I love that Adam responded. You know, I think like, if you look at these pictures, almost like formally, they're very similar. They both have these kind of angles going back into space. I thought a little bit of Carrie Mae Weems uh, kitchen table series, like where her table forms a proscenium. Can we go to the second one? Out of, yeah, out of which you know life can be performed. And I think that's very much Adam's picture. It's, it's his table, but it's a view into his domestic life, but it also really records a lot about world events, you know, like he was saying, how the table changes, um, how it reflected maybe the presidential election that year. I love to see it every day because to me, it was also a little bit of a, like a love story through objects and, you know, Rebecca's purse and Adam's hat. And it just seemed like uh, these objects were, um, yeah, playing out their, their love for one another somehow, you know? So I always love to see that picture. <laughs> And um, can I interject about the one that we're looking at? The one that we're looking at, November 9th, 2016, is the uh, night of the election that year. And um, in the days like building up to that night, like our, our kitchen table, like accumulated all this, like, you know, bag of chips and like unopened bills and stuff like that. And the computer open, like watching the news. And then the next day, like our, we, the table's clean. <laughs> it's like nothing, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, it really told a lot. It, it was that like that kind of proscenium arch that room. Um, uh, in, in, in an interview that we did prior to the exhibition being on view, Adam, you described the project as, as seeing nothing happening while things are, while time is passing. Um, and you also made mention to um, to two kind of like almost like a paradoxical idea. It's like, if you study these images enough, you'll know as much as you possibly could about the people who took them. And then the other thing you said is, what's interesting is that a lot of the, the context for each of these images or for most of the images is kind of withheld, right? Um, like a lot of the information that informs these images that make up the objects on your desk or the experiences happening outside of your window, um, you know, there's no context yet. And we don't know, you know, besides the date in this, for, in, for example, in this image, that this was quite an important and historical day for all of us. So it's quite loaded. Um, did you, did you think about that when you chose this image for the, the diptych is like, I want to include some moments so that people really pay attention to the dates that they pay attention. Um, well, what we should um, describe for your show, mm -hmm. um, there are two parts of, in your show. And one is a hanging projection of all 367 diptychs in a slideshow. Mm -hmm. And so in that one, all are included. And then there are framed prints and we're looking at the prints um, and there are a selection of 13 of the prints that are also in your show on the walls, like throughout the exhibition. And we chose 13, one from each month of the project. And so part of that is set. We were going to do November, 2016, but, you know, so we chose a day within 2016. Um, but that's just in this iteration of the project that's on view with you. Like the actual project includes all 367 uh, diptychs, you know? So. Gotcha. Um, do you have an installation shot of it? Like one of the pictures up? Yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the images that I really love and wanted to talk about. Um, it's this image, but here's the, this is one of the installations. And one of the things I should mention to the audience, if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition, but the way that we hung these works um, was rather than placing them in uh, a grid or in a line in a chronological order, we actually randomized the order of the presentation in terms of the dates within which the, or 
when they they're not they're not like clockwise chronological exactly and they're spread out through the gallery um in placed in between various works um, throughout the show. So as you walk through the show, you experience a little bit of a photo a day until you actually walk um, up to the video where you get a sense of the entire project as, um, as um, presented in that video work. And I can show that installation quickly because we were already talking about it. I'm just gonna skim through these really quickly. And so this is the video installation you see right here hanging. Um, in the gallery. And you can see two of the uh, calendar images that were actually placed next to one another. Uh, but those those dates, it's not like April and May. Um, we definitely wanted to kind of mix things up to create a kind of a randomized structure to it. If you want the structure, you want to see these images in order, you can watch the film. Um, I had a, I have a question. Well, one before before we get to this image um, from- Go back to the one before it, just real quick. Because- mm -hmm. um, I, you just alluded to like, whatever, that, that things happen outside the, um, that phrase that I said that like, you know, time is passing, nothing happens or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like in the picture before that, there's like our mail for like our voting registration and stuff like that. It's actually, everything's in these pictures. And uh, with auras, you can clear, like mine, I, I was living in Los Angeles at the time. So th there's not that much weather, you know, but with Aura living in New York, like you can follow the passing of time, in, you know, there's snow in this day, you know? So mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, <clears throat> maybe just quickly, if we could go back to the uh, video, I mm -hmm. just wanted to say you know, when I saw the installation, I mean, I love the installation in this long haul and our initial idea had been to rear project it so that on one side you would, I don't know if I'm giving away like some secret here, but um, that it was going, you know, it, it would be reversed. So you would come from one end of the hall and see it one way and then pass through and it would be reversed. And uh, it turned out that just logistics didn't really allow that. So then um, we had the idea to do two projections. One is like this, where this is the way that we um, kind of framed the images with mine on the left and Adam's on the right. But then on the reverse side, um, we have them inverted. So there were actually two videos. And I'm not exactly sure like what, why that feels so good to me. Um, except it's something about like, like through the looking glass or, you know, that um, song d'un poet, like that um, where the, the poet like pierces through the wall and everything through the window, through the mirror rather, and everything is reversed. And, and it feels like it's got something to do with time and that you can walk down the, the passageway and see time in one way. And then you come back and, you know, it's reversed. Um, so. There's, there was something else that, um, that y'all said in your interview that was, that I thought was quite interesting and related to this idea of having two projections on a single screen and it, and had to do with this idea of two perspectives um, of different artists with uh, different ways of approaching art making. Um, you know, Adam, Adam suggested that you know, the issues and um, the ideas that come to him are filtered through his like interior life or sort of his like interior perspective. Whereas Aura, you are um, reflecting on um, your sort of like interiority, your, 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 your personal subjectivity through the lens of the outside world. So we have somebody shooting out of a window, we have somebody looking inside. And here we have two different perspectives presented on one object right for people to um to walk around to see these like kind of you know um to see this uh, sort of duality to see things get flipped and reversed to have a moment to say to ask themselves these questions about um why there are two um, mm -hmm. this is it also kind of made me think about um that jean sarkowski show from like 1979 windows and mirrors mm -hmm. which was um supposed to be, first of all, it was supposed to feature like what he considered the most important 
photographic work of that time and also where photography was headed. Mm -hmm. And it was an exploration of subjectivity as opposed to objectivity. I mean, the window being the objective, the mirror being the interiority, but also that photography is never just that. I mean, the most objective photograph always has like a subjective component and, you know, vice versa, the most subjective always has a foot in the real world. And, you know, I think, I think Sarkowski really recognized that, although he, he omitted from sort of a sidebar, he omitted from that show uh, the work of uh, Cindy Sherman, Richard Prince, who were working at that time. There was the pictures show at Artist Space, which kind of questioned the whole idea, idea of subjectivity that is as a construction, as a kind of cultural construction. So, um, but it, but I thought that our, you know, our choices of views had something to do with that also really questioning this uh, kind of duality of subjectivity, objectivity, neither is, is uh, pure, you know? And, but it was funny and I hadn't really thought about it until I looked at the project in total that I was always looking through a window. Mm -hmm. wherever I was in the world. And Adam was always kind of looking in his domestic space, but it, you know, yeah, but it always pointed beyond that. I mean. Yeah, the image that we're looking at mine is of a floor. It's maybe of like clothes and maybe shoes and bags on a floor. <laughs> so surfaces with objects on them, maybe. Can I, can I pull, maybe we can talk about specific images in the series um, and then we can kind of pull some information out of that and provide some context around the project from, from there. So most of the images, um, you, Adam is in LA um, and Ara is in New York or Berlin, but there is one image and I, and I placed this at the very beginning of the exhibition um, like right in front of our title wall where the view is the same on the left and the right. This is January of 2017. Can you talk about this image and uh, why it's unique in relation to the rest of the project? My memory of this photograph is that Aura sent me the picture on the left in the morning. And that night she had, her and John had Rebecca and I over for dinner and uh, knowing that I was going to be able to be at her place, I took the picture on the right. So this picture that I'd been studying for like three months by this point or whatever. It's fun. Um, yeah, There's a reflection in it. I've actually never noticed the figure that's in the upper left. I wonder if that's... Can you tell who it is? Uh-uh. -uh. Of that. Um, yeah, I, I, I liked placing this at the very beginning of the show because it kind of gives people a false impression of what they're going to get as they move through the show. But hopefully as they come back through the exhibition, the exhibition is designed in such a way that um, seeing it one way offers you one perspective, one experience and coming back offers you new moments to, um, to learn something about the works that you've already seen, right? After viewing it once, um, you have an opportunity to revisit the works that you've seen on the wall and pull something different from it. And this is a great example of that is after you see the, the rest of the exhibition, after you read about the work on the didactic, after you view the video, you'll realize this is the only image that um, both of the images are the same, but uh, within the diptych, which I thought was really, really wonderful. So in the beginning, when I was talking about Aura and my history collaborating together before we started this project, um, I was in New York that week because I organized a group show that was that probably opened that Friday or whatever, um, maybe Saturday. Um, and so, and which was a, a group show at Magenta Plains called A Garden of Forking Paths. Um, but Aura and I uh, had collaborative collage work in that show. Um, and I organized another group show called Windows at the David Peterson Gallery in Minneapolis in May, maybe, of that year. And Aura and I also showed collaborative collage in that. Um, and which during this period of time, a point that I could have made 
before, but she and I like sort of in this image, like our lives, like the sort of paths of our lives intersect. Um, but the rest of the year, we weren't together in person, even though our lives overlapped in the way that we worked together, like many, many times. And um, it's not explicit in the photographs. Um, and that's huh. something that the sort of photographs lie about is how much we actually were in each other's lives during that year by communicating in this way. That's so funny, Adam. I had never thought about how this related to the title of your show, which is from a Borges short story, I think, Garden of the Forking Paths. The Garden of Forking Paths, yeah. Paths. yeah. So that's so you were thinking about that. There's also something really uncanny about this picture. It's it's now that I look at it, it's almost like a little scary or something like like falling through the looking glass. Like you've been looking at a at a scene for all this time and then all of a sudden you're there and you're photographing it yourself. It, it's really uncanny. Absolutely. And that's the installation. And if um, the audience was here for the beginning, the title slide showed another angle of this with the title on. I wanted to talk, I love this image. Um, I think it's incredibly beautiful. I think, um, yeah, and, and the image on the, so this is a good, uh, a good way to talk about those images that don't align with, your ex with the expectations for those viewers who are walking through this project, expecting to see you know, a view from um, or a, your window and a view from, from, uh, of Adam's um, kitchen table. But the image on the left, Ara, is an image that was taken while you were traveling, correct? Yeah, yeah. And um, I had gone to Berlin. Well, I spent a lot of time in Berlin. I lived there in the summer for like 30 years. But this was in March. And the view is from the hotel room at Hakkasha Markt because we were there with John's Barnard class. We usually go there in March for a week to show the girls the, the city. So that week, all the photos are, I chose this view and John's colleague, John Sitzer, purposely got us this room because she knows how much I love to look out on. That's the, um, the TV tower in East Berlin. And the TV tower was really the, one of the tallest structures in East Berlin. And it was built by the communist government to tower over the city and for people in the West to see it, and it sort of, you know, like a technological marvel. Um, a couple of funny facts about it. That ball part is actually, um, inside of it is a dining room that turns very slowly for you. I've never been inside of it, but I saw um, a movie. I'm, tr I'm trying to remember the name of the artist who did it. Um, but anyway, another, fact of uh, that ball is very reflective and when the sun shines it forms a cross which was kind of upsetting for the communist the atheist communist government that they had this big cross <laughs> on that you know on that monument um and then Adam, I, a lot, so both of you have pr probably realized that a lot of my questions are centered around the notion of intention. So I have another question about did you intend? Um, so Adam, your photos often contain a vase of flowers centered in the in the on the kitchen table, and I'm curious to know, or that appears quite often. Was that was that an intention? Did you intend to place these flowers on that table so that the passage of time was marked throughout these these images, so that because there's images where we have like a vase full of bright, brilliant flowers and then images like this where they're starting to kind of wilt and wither um, through the passage of time. It's something that you see uh, more clearly in the, in the video presentation. Um, like the two parts of your question are about intention and about flowers. Um, and flowers first, um, I've made art using images of flowers like forever back from, um, and, you know, I was just saying this to somebody, um, but my, my mom's a pretty good 
um, totally pedestrian photographer, you know, no ambition in it, but like actually a very good photographer. And um, in my childhood, she, and she still does, but she took these really beautiful photographs of flowers, just like real simple center frame, just like flower, you know, like, um, and so like, as I grew up, I would give her gifts of art, however I was making art at the time of flowers for her, for her birthday or whatever. Right. Um, and then at some point I started to continue to do that in my work. And there was a period of time where the only images that I worked with were images of flowers. Um, but that I don't think actually has anything to do with the flowers being on that table. Like that was pretty much the surface in our house at that time. Other than that, there was like a couch and a bed and like, you know, shelves but like that was our table pretty much so it was real all purpose yeah and um but you know i would try i would try to not edit the table you know but then sometimes i would put something like in the you know because i wanted it to be in the pictures you know like to maybe like communicate to aura or you know like commemorate the moment in some kind of way um there's one that's not um, in the 13 that we selected, but there's uh, at one point, um, Barbara S had sent me like a, one of her microscope photographs of like IDs. She was doing these um, like identification cards, IDs, you know, and like zooming in and like photographing different parts of them through a microscope. And she had taken a picture of an F and had sent it to me like haloed and that's, you know, so when I got it in the mail, I took it out and then put it like there where the flowers are pretty much. And it was there for a couple of days, you know, stuff like that. But the, I tried not to edit our mess, you know, and to photograph just like how the table was, you know, even though I'm like pretty neat and I like pick up all the time. So I do like clean up like regularly. So anyway, so. And and upon receiving the images in your inboxes each day, did you, did you find the time? Um, did either of you find the time to study them, to study the images? Did you ever talk about the images to one another while you were sending these images? I really don't remember us talking about them, Adam. Do you? I mean, I can remember sending something like, ah, oh, great one or whatever. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah, main, usually it was just in the subject line. Like there wasn't much of a email cart you know correspondent picture was the thing um i would say like slightly different than that like for 367 days we sent each other an email a day that included a photograph and if we needed to write each other more we would mm -hmm. you know but most of the time the purpose of us emailing each other was to send each other the image this is another image where Adam is traveling. This is another image. So this is the image from Ara, like on the left, this is an image taken in Berlin, correct? No, that's in Warsaw, where I was having a show at the um, Gallery of Studio called um, Angel of History. Um, and this was from my hotel window. Kind of a funny building across the street because it was almost like they painted in the shadow of light um yeah um that that particular one is interesting um in that the it took you like two or three days to like find exactly the frame that you wanted and so the frame is slightly different until you find the frame that you want and then you repeat that frame yeah but it's funny you know looking at it now putting these two together how mine, like I was photographing a building that was pretending that it had light falling on it. And your picture, of course, is authentic <laughs> light. Yeah. I mean, the light, Funny. the light in Los Angeles is beautiful. And we had a window on that side that would cast that light across. But the, you know, over the course of the year, the sun changes its place. So at some point, it's just like, raking across that wall and at other point it barely comes in that window yeah just to say i wanted to talk before we go to the q a this is another installation image before we go to the q a i have one more image i'd really like to talk about and then if um 
And that's also to mention that anybody in the audience, if you're watching on Zoom or YouTube, if you're watching on Zoom, you can enter questions for Adam and Ara um, via the chat. Um, or if you're watching on YouTube, just send us a, a comment and um, I'll field those questions to Adam and Ara. So um, feel free to, to go ahead and do that now. Um, but I wanted to ask a question specifically about this image. It's one of my favorite images in the, in the entire, of the entire project, at least as part of the, the project uh, as it exists as calendars, uh, calendar diptychs. Can, can each of you talk about your respective images in this? Okay. Um, I'll, go first. I'll, go, I'll go first, because yours has got the real, the real bang, you know? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how much I have to say about that. I mean, it's like, except for that, I think that that's a particularly beautiful image, like the light and the, how dark it was. And it really feels like a um, 16th century, 17th century still life painting, that one, like really like gets that vibe and it has everything to do with the light and it's incredible. And the dead flowers and different, everything that's on there, it's like pretty good. Um, but again, that was just the day. That was my day. Um, and Aura, you talking about yours, I guess. Yeah, this is the view out of the window of the, the ground floor bedroom in the farmhouse that John and I have been renting in the, su in the summer for the last 20 years in Mallorca. And um, we used to go there with our daughter and when she was little, Carmen, and this year, 2017, was the year she got married in Mallorca because she just loves it so much. And um, this was the bedroom, I think, where she was staying with her husband. They were at the hotel where they were getting married. So I snuck into the room and um, took the pictures out this window. This was also the bedroom that John and I used to to use. It's, it's also looking out on the clothesline where we hang our wash, our bathing suits after we go to the beach. This had all these circular beach towels that year. So it's a happy picture. And I believe this is the day of their wedding. Yeah. Right. Which I had forgotten. <laughs> Adam, Adam wrote to me and he said, did they get married on the 21st of July? And I think that was, so it was really conscious choice to uh, for this, to choose this day. Yeah. And I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be this diptych <clears throat> uh -huh. because this diptych is so good. Um, but I was hoping that it was in fact the day. Yeah. I remember when you called me and I'm going, gee, I don't remember. I'll look it up. It's, it's interesting to hear you say that you wanted it that way, that you chose it specifically because the whole, mo most of the project was not about establishing any sort of rules or deciding any, um, that we need to do this one thing. You're saying, you're saying that you're not trying to stage an image. You're trying to make a beautiful photograph uh, to send to your friend. Um, but then the presentation for this as an exhibition was like, com was thoroughly thought out. This was a project that you know, where you documented the passage of time and then five years later looked back through those memories, you know, via these photos to try and piece together a, a narrative that's mostly withheld from the audience, but very special to you, which I think is quite interesting. Well, it's, it's like, you know, all photography, like there's a world that's going on outside of the image. Um, and, um, Maybe I could just talk briefly about my photo in this one, mm -hmm. um, because I realized when you asked us, Max, to start, you know, choosing pictures and talking about, you know, that I didn't know which view to choose out of my Berlin apartment. First, I, I chose the courtyard. I live at Concert Berlin and I and there's a beautiful courtyard with a Dan Graham cafe, let ceiling glass cafe. But I switched the view because um, this is out my living room window and across the street, these are still uh, kind of, they look like they did um, in 1991 when we first came to Berlin. You know, they're, they're full of um, uh, bullet holes. That white building is, um, it was a, a hospital built by the Jewish community. And I'm not sure what it is right now. I think it still belongs to the Jewish community, but it's it's very mysterious. The doors open and close and cars slip in and out. And there's a lot of security around it. 
Next to it was the Jewish Girls' School, which has been uh, renovated. It was taken over by um, some entrepreneurs who built um, Stefan Lanver, who built one of the fanciest restaurants in Berlin there. And um, there's a Jewish ki uh, kosher kitchen or something. So it's funny. I mean, there's a lot. I realize there's a lot of history um, on that street. It's one of the few streets in the neighborhood that parts of parts of a street that are still kind of ruins. I'm not exactly sure why. I wish they would fix it up. And then this is, I'm just gonna go through the rest and then I think that we have a few questions from the audience that I think we can get to. Um, just so that folks get an idea of what this installation looks like in space and what the rest of those images look like. This is the I really one. love that you kind of, you know, space the diptychs through the installation also, because again, it's kind of going back to time and not making it chronological, but kind of reminding over and over about time, you know, time passing. And mm -hmm. well. well, that that came out of a conversation that I had with Adam when, because most, so for the audience, um, the presentation of this project grew at PhotoFest, grew out of a studio visit I did with Adam maybe a year and a half or two years ago. It was a long time ago, um, or, or maybe it wasn't that long ago. I can't, I can't even remember. It was maybe before the pandemic. Um, I don't remember us masking. I don't remember. Yeah, um, but I had, so I, I'm a big admirer of Adam's F project. I've been subscribing and, and buying um, the, the magazine as soon as I learned about it and um, been going to the galleries to fawn over Adam's shows. And so I did a Google search one day at work of Adam Marnie artist and up popped uh, a lot of images of the flower works that you had talked about before and things that I did not know about um, Adam. And I said, Adam, can I do a studio visit? And Adam graciously was like, would you like to come and see the show? <laughs> and then if you want, we could do a quick studio visit and look at my work. And um, we looked at his work. I was having such a great time. I was really excited. We looked at the exhibition. It was fantastic. And while I was leaving, Adam said, you know, I did this, this, um, this thing with our Rosenberg. And, and I don't know if, um, I don't know what it is, but it's a year of images that we shared with one another. And it could be interesting for a project. And immediately before even seeing the images, I was like, if you ever wanna do something with that, I would love to work with you uh, to make this happen. And a lot of that was based on seeing your work, knowing Ara's work, um, and then also being in love with artist practices that document and mark time. Um, and I was thinking a lot about Bernadette Meyer's work, uh, Memory. Um, and and this, this work kind of reminded me that of like paying close attention to your, of your living um, or the idea of this project did. And so that's kind of how this presentation happened. And then Adam and Aura built, began having a conversation once this became a more serious idea of having an exhibition and built the project together collaboratively, built the idea of a presentation collaboratively. And then I would just simply ask questions like, how do you wanna present this in the space? What is your intention? And then Adam said, um, I, I think it should be spread out. I don't think it should be linear. It doesn't fit, it doesn't really align with the theme of the exhibition to be linear or chronological. And um, Adam's a fantastic curator and uh, he's often right, and he was, and I thought it was, so that that idea, I, don't, I just wanna make sure, like I'm not taking credit for that, that was brilliant. Um, <laughs> and that's the longest way to get around <laughs> to that. But um, I thought it's it's kind of an interesting, for those people who are in the uh, the audience, um, who are, you know, curators or artists, that's, that's the, that was the nature of our collaboration, it was really like a question and to see what happens, um, mm -hmm. it was playful. I also want to say that it like the form of the our installation uh, it was our response to this show and to the space. And in our talking about um, what form it would take, we came up with many other ideas that we would, uh, if given the opportunity, would happily uh, put into different forms at different times. Yeah. 
I think we will, Adam, you know, because also we did this year of photographs and then it just kind of sat in our inboxes for how many years, like four years. And I think, well, one thing that happened, I, I spent most of the year in Berlin of the pandemic year. And um, I, uh, a young man in the BARD program, uh, Ryan Miller, I'm trying to remember his last name now. Anyway, you can see I don't have a great memory. That's why I need to take pictures so I can remember things. Um, I wanted to work as an intern and I, I wasn't letting anybody really in my apartment. I was like, where I was using it as my studio. It's like, well, what can I do with him? And then I thought, well, there is this project. Maybe we could look at it again. And so we kind of, that's how it started. We pulled it out and, um, and it was shortly after that, that Adam told me about your show, you know, and that we would put it into some kind of form for the show. So I can imagine it taking different forms, but again, over maybe longer periods of time, maybe we're like, you know, not going to do anything with it for another year or two or three. I don't know. I wanted to get to the, to the audience questions. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I don't want to, I don't want to give anybody zoom fatigue um, who doesn't already have it. Um, but Natalie Heron asks, um, can you talk more about, why conducting a collaboration that is specifically rule-based was of interest to you? And did you have a sense that you would eventually exhibit the results of this project? Do you want to answer first? Well, you're the one who wanted to make the rules. So. Oh, shit. Well, I think Aura and I both like rules, I would say. And um, especially for like in, in constructing our work. I think both of us like to construct rules and boundaries and stuff like that. And it's it, it, speaking for myself, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in determining, you know, some limit or some kind of container and then to explore whatever freedom can exist within that container or to try to break, you know, to like identify what is inhibiting freedom and to try to break through that freedom. I mean, that's, probably more or less like my project. Um, but Aura, I, I would say that you do the same thing, like very much so. It's true. I mean, I guess I never thought of them exactly as rules, but I do believe that a kind of compression is, is productive, you know, that if you kind of have every possibility in the world, um, well, maybe that's okay, you know, like, but I also do like to work within limits. Um, I'd never thought of it as concisely as you did by like sending me a set of rules. Um, it's, John's gotta go get the clothes out of the dryer, I think. Um, so, but it was fun. It was, and you know, that's one thing I love about collaborations is they always kind of, push you to do things that are unexpected. We can't all have everything inside of ourselves, or at least I don't feel I can. So as soon as um, Adam suggested the making the rules, like I said, then I started to research, like what have artists come up with it as rules and... Um... Yeah, and I think what we were looking at, like John Baldzari, who is a master teacher, and that, you know, his assignments for his students and, you know, I, I know many, 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 many good teachers that I'm friends with are like excellent in creating assignments and assignments are great ways to explore things that you wouldn't on your own because you're like reacting to something. So I guess I've tried to do that. And that's something that you and I created was uh, to, you know, give ourselves like a direction to move in and, so and we responded to that direction. So thank you for your question, Natalie. Yeah. It's a wonderful question. I have a question, <laughs> if, if I may jump in. And I mean, it's kind of a two part question. Was there a time where you felt you were violating your rules? And 
was there a time when you felt like you were trying to send a message to the other purely through the photograph? That's a great question. <laughs> um, oh, I guess it's well, two questions. The rules are made to be broken. Um, that was like, you know, an epiphany for me as a, as a, as a young student, I think I was 19 in the Whitney independent study program. And like, you know, I was learning about like modernist painting and all the rules and what you could do and not do. And I was really trying to do it. And then all of a sudden I realized why I, you know, I can actually do anything I want. Um, which was really kind of standing up to those, you know, father figures who were laying down the rules. Whether in this specific instance, I was trying to break a rule that Adam had set up, I, I, I don't think so. Was it my rule? I don't know that it was my rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you sent me rules and I sent you rules. Yeah, but, I guess like the, the rules in this project were so simple. It was simply send a picture to each other a day. It was all it was. And you determined the, a direction of that that I responded to and followed suit by repeating and then like setting up this sort of image repetition. Um, but like we, if we weren't at home, then the picture had, was determined by the place that we were. So, and it, right. it, and then it became something that tracked both time and our place in the world in relation to it, one another. So I guess the answer to that, Stephen, is no, we weren't like, <laughs> I don't think we were trying to, you know, send one another kind of- Messages? Uh, yeah, I mean, we were sending messages, but they weren't transgressional messages, at least not on my part, maybe you. Yeah, no, but, right. But, sure. yeah. but as with many things, when you do it over a long period of time, it starts to accrue meanings that you could never have anticipated. Like it starts out with a very simple idea, but then it starts to encompass your life, the world, world events, you know, it's just a photo a day. <laughs> I think one of, one of the things that I really love about working and looking and thinking about this project now is the way in which you approached time or like had to deal with time, like being very present to make each of these images, to pay attention to your surroundings, whether domestic or outside of your window. And then now, you know, be, or I should say, while making these photos between 2016 and 20, 2017, having a moment every single day where you were very conscious of where you were and you knew that you were marking time in some kind of way, um, even if it was only to check in with a friend, um, you're saying, this is this moment for me. And then now when you're presenting this exhibition, it becomes like you're saying, or like a, a project of looking back and pulling meaning from it, um, from those moments. And a lot of that's, you know, based on your experience, following it, interpreting it through the dates, thinking about where you were when, you know, and that's, it's quite interesting to think about time in that way. The, the, that duality, I mean, there's always a, a duality in this project, whether it's a perspective um, or just the concept of time itself. And about being present, you know, that's that moment where you're present um, for yourself and for one another. Um, a, a couple of things about that. One is like some had more time that day to make a nice picture for Aura. You know, like I actually think about it or like take a few and then like later find the one that I wanted to do and send her that one or whatever. And then sometimes we'd be rushing around and they'd be like, wouldn't be able to have that consideration. So it's just like a crappy picture sent. And some of those are the best ones also. It's yeah. just like, there's no thinking about it. But in the slideshow also, uh, there are blanks where the two of us didn't make it if we forgot or the day just like flew past and um 
And so those are represented as just blanks. Um, but often there, there are no cases where we both forgot on the same day. So there's no case where it's a blank diptych, but there's an image and a blank or vice versa. So, you know, all the way through, like on one hand, like very considered on the other hand, forgot. <laughs> I was really surprised to find those blanks because I could have sworn that I sent a picture every day. I thought I was so kind of responsible about that, but um, I guess I forgot. That's something that I know, like in the sort of narrative of like what was happening in your life, that often there are moments when you were traveling jet lagged or before something super exciting was happening that you would forget <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. So, um, are there any more questions down there in the uh, Those, that's chat world? A, that's what we have right now. Um, and I think we should leave it there. It's really been a wonderful um, time talking and speaking with you. Um, I really appreciate you both. Oh, Rebecca Steez has a question before we sign off. Who did the graphic design for the calendars? Um, that was mainly Adam. There you go. Yeah. True. Now you know who to go to for your <laughs> calendar needs. Yeah. And, and, oh, and did it happen after the fact, after the images? Was that yes? And in one lump, yes. Um, we shot the pictures, Rebecca, we shot the pictures from October 9th, 2016 to October 10th, 2017. And we put it together. I did the design and we selected the images three months ago in 2021 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Rebecca. Um, <laughs> a good question. How do you find a good collaborator? That's a long question to answer. How, make good friends. That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah, start with friendship. I mean, yeah. that's, how, that's how you explained it in the beginning. Well, that's the nature of our uh, working relationship. It's I um, in the magazine. I work with all kinds of people, and some are much more difficult than others. And some of those relationships are the most fruitful. So yeah. it's not just about that either. Yeah. And then, like when you invited me to collect to curate a section of the one, one uh, of yeah. the F issues, and then I invited a whole bunch of people to collaborate. The fourth issue of my magazine uh, has like the uh, middle section or pretty much like curated, like the whole, like a big chunk of the magazine in response to the third issue. But uh, that was also like collaborating with all these, uh, inviting all these other artists to do some kind of, you know, image for the magazine or. Yeah, that's um, a great one. Yeah, that was a good one. And I don't know, you really, you've pushed me like to write, to do collaborations that I never thought I could do with the people. You know, like, all right, you're going to, there was one with Nick Guanini, and he's a writer, but he refused to write anything. He was just going to do the pictures, and mm -hmm. I had to do the writing. So, I mean, that's also a good collaborator who kind of pushes you to do things that are out of your comfort zone, I suppose. Yeah. For, for, me, I, I, for me, I always find that a collaborator is important for it's important for a million reasons but one of the best parts of having a collaborator is that you get to share your excitement about something that is so specific with someone else who understands the significance of whatever you're working on and so for for me it's if i'm curating a project with uh with another co-curator like evan and, and ryan uh, for this project, when Adam Marnie and Ara Rosenberg signs on to the project and says, we'd love to do a new work with you, we could all celebrate together and get excited together. And um, that that creates momentum and motivation to keep going because you get to share these little moments that um, people outside of the project might not um, might not under, uh, might not otherwise understand. Um, and I, I think Rebecca is asking, um, how do we find you? So Adam, Adam Marnie, you can learn um, more about Adam's projects on fmagazine.info and Ara, Ara's projects and information can be found on ararosenberg.com. They both have excellent, very up-to-date websites. Um, I, I think that's where we should leave it. Um, we're, we're going over time. 
Um, but I really want to, I want to thank you both again, not only for joining us for this talk, but for, um, yeah, for, for working with PhotoFest, with me, with Ryan, with Evan, with, um, with Brandon, who's on the, in the background running the show, um, you know, on this exhibition, it's been such a pleasure to learn from you. Um, I'm such a fan <laughs> and it's, it's just been really great. This whole experience has been really wonderful. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And, and I'm so pleased that we were able to talk about this with our audience. Well, thank you. Um, really glad to be part of this and to be able to rec realize this project. Um, so. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you, you all. Too. Yeah. Thank you all for your time, Max, Adam, Aura, Brandon, uh, and being so generous with your time and the information. It was, it was terrific. Have a great night. Yeah. Bye, everybody. And um, for the attending audience, if you are around next Wednesday at 12 p.m., we're going to have a conversation between Regina Agu, another artist featured in, in Place of an Index, um, and she will be in conversation with Nora Khan, um, an amazing writer um, based in uh, New York. Um, so you should definitely come next Wednesday, uh, 12 p.m., and uh, we'll see you there. Adam, Ara. Good night. Good night. Good night.